Well, good morning, church family. Good morning. It is a pleasure to be with you again and bring God's word to you this morning. We are yet again in the book of 1 Corinthians. Surprise, surprise. So, um, man, it is, it is good to gather together and sing praises to our great king, is it not? Yes. Amen. Well, um, this morning we're going to jump into Corinthians chapter 9. We're going to be in verses 1 through 14. So Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1 through 14. Uh, I switched it up this week. I'm in my Ryrie study Bible on mine. It's uh, page 1829 in your pew Bible. It's I don't know what at the moment because we have three different versions of Bibles floating around. Uh, usually around 867 is the most common one, but there you have it. Uh, let's read God's word. So the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, writes this. He says, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen our Lord? Are you not my workmanship in the Lord? If to others I'm not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who would examine me. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Is it only Barnabas and I who have no, have no right to refrain from working for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? Do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Is it for the ox that God is concerned? Does he not speak entirely for our sake? It was written for our sake because the plowman should plow in hope and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much that we reap material things from you? If others share this rightful claim on you, do we not even more? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than to put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple and those who serve in the altar share in the same sacrificial offerings? In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we are indeed blessed to be able to come into your presence today and hear your word through the reading of Scripture. Thank you, Lord, that you want us to draw near to you, that you want us to be a people that are close to you and made to be more like you. And it is through your word that you do that in our world and in our lives. So please, Father, give us attentive hearts ears that can hear and be convicted by your spirit. Father, we ask as we do each Sunday morning that you would, by the spirit of God, use the word of God to reveal to us the son of God, all for the glory of God. In your name, amen. So, um, how many of you recognize this book? Show of hands. It's less and less as it gets older and older. How many of you recognize that guy? Anybody? It's Shel Silverstein, poet, author. He wrote this book, The Giving Tree. It's one of my favorite books as a kid for a whole slew of reasons. And in it, it parallels the life of a little boy and a tree, right? That of an apple tree, specifically. And what happens is this little boy's young, and he plays with this tree, and they have a wonderful time, and the tree loves playing with the little boy, adores it, in fact. And yet, as the boy grows up and gets older and older, he spends a little less and a little less and a little less time with the tree. And then one day, the boy's grown up a little bit, and he says, well, I want some money. And the tree says, well, I don't have any money, but I have apples, so take all my apples and go and sell them in the marketplace, and you can have some money. So the boy does that. And the tree's happy, but like misses the boy. And then the boy's gone for a while, and he comes back again and says, I'm older now, and I want a house. Can you give me a house? And the tree loves this boy, but doesn't have a house. So what's the tree say? Take my branches, boy, and cut them down, and you will have a house, and you will be happy. So boy takes branches, cuts them off builds a house. I want a wife. I want to be married. I need a house. Okay, here's my branches. 
Well, the boy doesn't come back for a long, long time. And he comes back almost a kind of ornery old man. He says, I want to get away from here. Can you give me a boat? And the tree says, I don't have a boat, but I'll give you my stump. Actually, my trunk, really. So cut down my trunk, carve out a boat, and you can sail away. Right? And this keeps going on and on and on and on. And eventually, the tree is left with just a stump. And the old man comes in, this little boy who has grown into this very, very, very old man, says, I don't need anything anymore. I just want to sit down. I'm tired. And the tree boosts herself up as tall as she can and makes herself a nice little stump. And she's happy for a time because the boy's happy. And it's this really interesting story. There's some parallels to it, I think, of, of what our parents do for us throughout the years. There's, if you've ever seen the statue, there's a really cool sculpture, it's uh, I think in Spain at the moment, um, of this picture of a dad holding his son's hand and he's giving himself a piece of his sculpture and the son is made up of all these little pieces that the dad has taken out of himself. It's just a, a really unique take on parenting that what, what we do for our kids is just give and give and give and give pieces of ourselves, right? But there's something that's interesting that not only parallels the story of the giving tree, but that I think is interesting and simultaneously really sad. Because the tree was happy to give of herself. But the boy didn't necessarily reciprocate the same kind of love for the tree, did he? This tree loved to give of herself. And every time I read that story, even now, it makes me sad. Because it makes me think... This tree in the story, this, this metaphor of this person, this tree, this, this idea of somebody willing to give everything for somebody else's sake, even though they didn't really seem to deserve it. The boy never really seemed to reciprocate that same kind of love that the tree had for the boy. And really, if we, if we peel back a whole slew of layers going on in the story, there's actually something really eerily similar in the gospel in the story of the giving tree. Right? Ultimately, the tree gave her life for a person who doesn't seem to deserve it. Like you and I. Right? How we're rebels to God, aren't seeking after God of our own volition. We're not showing any inclination towards loving God initially. We're not worshiping God. We're not chasing after God. And it was God who, in fact, chases after us. And then God sends his own son to live the life that we could not who died the death that we deserved. God sent his son to live the perfect life to show humanity what we were designed to do, how we were designed to live. And ultimately, Jesus is the one that pursues us, gives of himself and sacrifices his life for our sake, just like the giving tree. And then if you look in our text, the Apostle Paul actually models the same type of life for the church in Corinth. He sacrifices whatever is necessary so that the gospel goes forward and so that others benefit. In fact, his life is an illustration for the church of, of what he's just taught in chapter 8. So last week, we studied the issue about food being offered to idols, right? And Paul taught that this church, uh, you may have the right to eat this, you may have the right not to, it's kind of a conscience thing. You may have the freedom, or at least you may think that you do, to eat this food or that food, whatever's necessary according to your opinion, but you should restrict that right for the sake of others, because that's what love does. Love sacrifices. It gives, it builds up, rather than trying to serve itself. And so this week, Paul's going to, I hope, teach us as we go through this passage, what I want is to you to have this in the back of your mind. Um, Paul has a right to certain things as an apostle. He has a right to certain things as a gospel minister. But he's willing to give that up so that the gospel goes forth. Others will benefit because of Paul being willing to give up some things. So his life is actually an illustration of exactly what he just taught. So they had this knowledge, they had these freedoms, and he says, are you willing to set aside these freedoms that you have for your brothers and sisters in Christ? So Paul's point 
at the end of chapter 8 that is really brought into the argument of chapter 9 is are you willing to lay aside whatever is necessary, your personal opinions, your preferences, maybe even the things that are your very rights for the sake of our brothers and sisters in Christ so that they could be built up in the gospel. He specifically uses it at first in the context of the church. And then in chapter 9, he will use it in the context of the gospel going forth from the church. As a matter of fact, if you recall, he finishes chapter 8 by saying he's willing to go vegan for Jesus, right? He says, if eating meat causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again. And we ask the question, I think reasonably, like, would you go vegan for me? If, if it caused me to stumble, if it caused another brother or sister to stumble, would you refrain from eating meat for that person's spiritual benefit? That's the kind of radical, sacrificial love that Paul's calling. So Paul's saying, that's how much I'm concerned about you. I won't even, I won't even eat meat. So Paul's going to keep asking similar questions, but this is our main point of application today. I want to ask this question now, and then we'll refer to it later. Does your life reflect a willingness to sacrifice so that others will grow in Christ or so the gospel will go forth? See, Paul knew that this young church needed a model for gospel-centered, other-centered, Jesus-following, sacrificial kinds of lives. And he was the one that brought them to Christ, right? He was their father in the Lord, as it were. He and Silas went to Asia Minor for a while, and eventually they get to the Mediterranean Sea, and they didn't know where they were supposed to go. And then we get to Acts chapter 17 and 18, we get the Macedonian call. Right? That's what we read in Acts 18. God says, go and preach the gospel. It's going to start in Jerusalem, right? then to Judea, then to Samaria, and then to the utter ends of the earth. So God uses originally the apostles to establish the church in Jerusalem and then surrounding, and then calls Paul to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. And so Paul goes on these missionary trips, and he's starting to go out with Paul and or Silas and Timothy. He's doing these trips, and they get to Corinth. And there's, there's some really incredible things going on. People are being converted. The gospel is going forth. Some people didn't like it, but Paul didn't care because he was more concerned about the gospel transforming lives than he was concerned about himself. In fact, he's beaten repeatedly. He's thrown out of towns. Because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's got his reputation blown to smithereens in many places. This guy who was at one point lauded for his wisdom and his training is now being run out of town in many places. So the question that we would ask is, does your life, does my life, reflect a willingness to sacrifice, to possibly lay down our rights so the gospel growth would take place. Look at verse 3. Well, actually, 1 through 3. It says this, Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my workmanship in the Lord? If to others I'm not an apostle, at least I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to show those who would examine me. Right? So Paul's got this really unique place in world history. There's a particular call to Paul, road to Emmaus, right? Road to Damascus, 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 sorry. We're getting there. He's got this particular call at this really particular unique juncture in history, right? And he's also got an incredibly unique mission. He's not called to bring the gospel to the Jews necessarily, although he is very, very capable of doing so, as he evidences throughout his New Testament writings. He's called to bring the gospel outside to the Gentiles. This new thing, quote-unquote, that God is doing, even though it's the same thing God's been doing since Genesis, it's this new thing that God's now doing, right? You understand the, the irony there? So he's commissioned by Jesus to go and preach the gospel wherever God would send him. And Paul says to the Corinthians in verses 1 through 3, you are my seal of apostleship. And and really what's going on is a couple of things. One, think about the people that that were lauded in Corinth. 
You've got Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, the great philosophers of wisdom. These are people that, this is the same road they would have walked. So you have these orators that are, that are expounding on all this wonderful wisdom, and they're commanding fees, right? They're asking for people to pay them, or they're having people that are following them around, training them, and the people that they're being trained by are willing to pay these speakers to hear their wisdom. And Paul says, actually, I, you know I'm a tent maker. I don't, even, I don't even take money from you. I could, but Barnabas and I, we, do, we work with our own hands. So there's a section in Corinthians that, that you understand that the people of Corinth potentially look down on Paul a little bit because it's almost like, it's almost like a pastor at a tiny little church that can only pay the guy part-time. And some people would look at that guy and be like, oh, it's really, like, I'm so glad that you're, you're doing that. Praise the Lord. But one day when you can be full-time, when you, like, graduate into full-time ministry, you'll be a real pastor. Believe me, I've, I've heard those things. I know brothers and sisters who have heard those things, who think, like, oh, well, you could do part-time ministry. You could just, but, like, like, unless, unless you can really find the church that wants you, good luck. And that's a little bit of what's going on with Paul, because he's not doing this thing full time and, and taking money for it. It's that little principle of, like, if you got to pay for it, it's worth something. But if I'm not paying for it, ah, it's probably not worth all that much, right? So to the perception of the Corinthians, his value it's potentially lower than all these other orators going on. So what's Paul say to this? Well, he says, your transformed lives in the gospel is proof of my apostleship. And as a result of, of being an apostle, of being a gospel minister, I have the right to exercise some authority. And he gives us three rights in verses 4 through 6. He tells us what his rights were as an apostle or as a gospel minister. He has the right to material support. Look at verse 4. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Right? As Paul ministers in a particular place, he's expecting to receive kind of some basic needs provided. But he says, no, no, no. We have that right. It says food and drink, right? The second one says, do I not have the right to support a wife? Is the right to support a wife. Don't we have the, the right, Barnabas and I, to take along a believing wife? Right, he mentions that all the other apostles seem to be married and have no issue in their churches, many of which they're, they're operating in full-time pastorates, not itinerantly like Paul, support a wife. And he makes mention of the fact that most of the other apostles, Cephas, Peter, the brother of Lord Jesus, these all have wives. Remember in chapter 7, Paul says, you know, it's good to marry, but it's better to remain as you are, meaning possibly to remain single. And the reason is because the married person has to worry about material things, how they will please their husband or please their wife. They have to support a family. And Paul says, that's wonderful, but somebody who's not married can give their full attention to the Lord. But here he actually says there are some positive things to being married, right? I could take along a believing wife. You know, it would be really nice for Paul to have a believing wife along the journey to support him. Not just to, like, to go out and like, work full-time as a nurse somewhere like half the pastors in the world do, right? Like you ever meet a like, part-time or full-time pastor? Like 50% of them, their wife is a nurse, just so you know. The other 50%, their wife just plays the church piano. <laughs> That's just like a thing. It just happens, Right? It's funny how that works. But what Paul's saying is there's some really big positives. She could, she could support me in this ministry. She could come alongside. That would be a huge help. Barnabas and I would love to bring along a believing wife, it seems. And yet he doesn't make use of the right. Probably Paul's just trying to get off on the fact that he's really somewhat short, probably has a weepy eye, and maybe no lady was really, really interested in him. I'm sure that wasn't the case. But he happens to say, I just don't need a believing wife. I'm just not making that right known, right? But what's going on is he's actually saying, I lay that right aside for a particular reason, a particular purpose. 
The third thing he says is that he has the right to live only from the ministry of the gospel. He has the right to live from the ministry of the gospel. That's verse 6. Or is it only Barnabas and I that have the right to refrain from working for a living? See, according to Paul, if he wanted to, he could have expected for those that he enriched spiritually to support him materially. He could have been supported materially through the spiritual field that he was cultivating and planting and harvesting. And there was nothing wrong with that. But he uses wisdom here to tell the church, and ultimately to us, why a person who labors in the gospel could and probably should be expected to be supported by it. It's a weird message, by the way, for me to preach. Just so you know. Because like Paul's kind of laying down some, some theology for everybody that would go behind him into churches. And I'm really grateful for it, but it's weird to preach on. So like, just so we're all clear, this is a, a weirdly uncomfortable message for me to preach as the guy who is supported by the church, right? Just want to put that out there. But we get this wisdom in verse 7. He tells three other examples of what that support looks like. And he asks them again via questions. If you look at this section, it's just like question after question after question, right? Am I not? Am I not? Am I not? And he says, who serves a soldier as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? And so his first example is this soldier, right? Now we have a lot of soldiers here, a lot of people that are involved in the armed services all across the globe, locally, nationally, globally. Generally speaking, if the military is going to call you up to serve, you don't have to buy your rifle, right? If they're going to call you to fly planes, praise ye the Lord, you don't have to come up with the several billion dollars to fly the plane, to build, maintain, outfit, kit out the plane. Heaven forbid you have to pay it back when it crashes, right? Like, this is not a thing. A soldier is given the tools to serve. Likely, in the same way, someone who owns a vineyard, right? If they own a vineyard, the hope is that they're eating their own fruit. Probably not all of it, so that they're eating away their profits. But like, if you come up to a vineyard, and the guy who's growing the grapes doesn't, he goes out to like some other guy in the marketplace and buys their grapes to eat, you should probably question the vineyard guy growing his, like, I don't want to eat those grapes if he's not willing to eat them. And then you have the analogy of the shepherd. Right? He's saying, well, shepherds have the ability to assume they're gaining from being a shepherd. If they need clothing, hey, look, there's some wool. If they need milk, hey, there's a sheep. If they need meat, too bad, so sad. Paint some blood on the doorposts. Praise ye the Lord. Celebrate some Passover. But he's saying that those people who work in these endeavors, just in this worldly way, have every reason to expect to be paid for what they're due. And then he actually says the same thing is is happening spiritually. So he uses the analogy from Deuteronomy, do not muzzle an ox while he is threshing, to get at this greater principle. He says... Deuteronomy chapter 5 is where he's quoting from. Uh, For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Is it for the oxen that God is concerned? Right, what's going on here? Why, Why pick like a random passage in Corinthians 9 to talk about oxen? Well, what's going on is you have people who grow grain. It's a little bit of the echoes of the book of Ruth, by the way. But... The idea of what's going on here is all the grain comes in, gets thrown into this vat, and there's this ox that walks around in a circle crushing it all, right? And just like you wouldn't put a muzzle on the ox because it's naturally going to want to do hard work, bend down and grab a little bit of the grain and continue the hard work, you wouldn't put a muzzle on the ox while he's working. A, it's probably unfair for the ox. B, it's not stewarding creation well. And C, you're just going to end up like burning out your ox. And then you have no ox. You have a lot of meat for a little bit, right? 
Functionally, it's this like self-defeating idea. If you don't let the ox eat, you're going to have no ox. So what is all this actually for? What's the purpose of all this? Why all these interesting examples? It doesn't seem like the, the perfect place for randomly quoting about an oxen. I mean, Paul knows oxen don't read, so he's not writing this for the ox's benefit, right? Well, he does this first from secular occupations, and then he also, in verse 13 and 14, does this from even sacred occupations, as it were. It refers to the temple, right? So he says, do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple? And those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings. In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. So just like in the Old Testament, God was caring for the priest through the offering that was brought in by somebody else. Right? The priest in the Old Testament would partake of the material blessings of the work that he was doing. So even in religious duty, Paul says that the priests received wages for their work. And now those who make their chief aim to preach the gospel in the New Testament have a right to a living by those they minister to. So if we're not clear yet on what Paul's trying to say here, his point is that he, Paul, has a right. He has a right as an apostle, as a minister of the gospel. A person laboring in the ministry for the gospel has a right to receive their livelihood from the gospel. But he gives this really strange twist in verse 12. And if we hadn't read ahead, you, you might be surprised for what's coming. Because ultimately, this is, this is the hinge point of our passage. It's the foundational truth for our passage this morning. Paul's purpose is actually made really clear with one word in verse 12. He says, nevertheless, right? Nevertheless, we've not made use of this right. But we endure anything rather than to put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. He says he would not in any way ever desire to put a hindrance or an obstacle in the way of the gospel going forward. Paul says, I know I have the same right. I don't take it. I'm willing to lay aside that right for something that I see as far bigger. And what is that thing? What's the proclamation of the gospel, brothers and sisters? Paul doesn't want anything standing in the way of that going forward. In the Greek, it's this interesting word he uses. It's this idea of putting like a barrier or a gate, something that you would put in like your driveway to keep people out, right? There's, it's, it's really clear that it's not just like, like throwing a banana peel in front of somebody and hoping they slip on it, right? It's not like wily coyoteing it, waiting for the roadrunner to come around and being like, all right, acme pan, go. It, it is like deliberately building barriers around the gospel, and he's trying to prevent that, in every way possible. He doesn't want there, any, there to be any obstacles in the gospel going forward. What Paul is saying is, I don't ever want to be the obstacle. The gospel is offensive enough, right? Do we understand that? The gospel is offensive enough, right? So, like, if you come here, we've talked about this at least once or twice, Anybody that walks in the door, you and I don't want to be the offense that keeps them from Christ, right? I really want the gospel, if it's going to be offensive, we want the gospel to be the thing that's offensive. Why is the gospel offensive? Because the gospel says you couldn't do enough. No matter how hard you try, no matter what you do, it's never going to be enough. It's a hard message. It says, somebody had to do something you couldn't. Somebody else had to live a life that you could not. Somebody else had to die for you. Now, I'm supposed to believe that somebody died in my place because I'm not good enough. That's a hard and offensive message to anybody with any shred of dignity. Right? Right? Imagine how offensive the gospel is, not, not just 2,000 years ago. Imagine how offensive the gospel is in 2024. You can't be who you want to be because Christ died for you and expects you to live accordingly. 
You can't live the way you want to live. Because you were created by a God who owns the universe and asks you to behave accordingly. You're never going to be good enough. That's offensive to anybody and everybody. But here's the problem. What Paul's saying is, functionally, if there's anything I can do, not to minimize the word of God or the truth of Scripture, but to make that path easier for people, to believe the gospel, I'm going to do it. I'm going to let Chris preach on that next week because that's probably one of the hardest passages in all of Scripture for me. When Paul says, for the sake of the gospel, I am all things to all men, I just get like used car salesman thing. And not like the good used car salesman because there are some great ones. But like, but like the slick back, like really slimy, like 1970s, you know, like the engine's not actually in the car, but I'm sure it'll be just fine kind of car salesman. There's something about like a, like I became all things to all men. And that just feels a little, ugh. we'll talk about that next week. The reason that, that this is hard is because Paul's saying everything I'm about in life is making Christ magnificent and bringing the gospel anywhere and everywhere I can proclaim it. He's willing to sacrifice whatever he needed to to make sure that happened. And ultimately, the challenge for us is everything that we do, according to Paul, should be for the purpose of furthering the gospel. Is that what we're about here? Is that what Hilltown Baptist Church exists for? Are we actually about equipping the saints so that the gospel may be believed and cherished first in our own lives so that we can go boldly into the world with the glorious news of the gospel, the life, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Christ, and proclaim it in the lives of other people? Think back to last week, the issue of meat being offered to idols, right? He says, you have this right to partake of this meat. You have the freedom to eat of it. But what's more important, exercising that right or watching a brother or sister grow in Christ? Do you want to be the hindrance in their life that keeps them from either believing the gospel or growing in the gospel? The question is, what's more important? Exercising your rights or your freedoms or watching people grow in the gospel? That's why we said last week, keep your freedom on the leash of love, right? So do you see the link that Paul's trying to say here? He's trying to show the church how it is that his life is to model, and then by extension teach them how to live out the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's love for others, building people up, willing to sacrifice for others. Because this is what Jesus did for us. Christ is our model. It's what we see in Philippians 2. It's our model with our kids, parents. It's our model as husbands. Humility and service to others who are in our care, and potentially even those who aren't. The question that Paul keeps continually asking, and he'll ask this throughout the rest of our time, is are you willing to forgo your rights so that others may come to Christ? So the question I have is, does your life, does mine, reflect a willingness to sacrifice so others will grow in Christ, so that others might come to know Christ? Paul's not saying there's anything wrong with material goods, right? Everybody works hard for material goods. Everybody works hard to have happy families. There's nothing wrong with that in Paul's mind. But he wants them to have a focus to the point that the sacrifice he's asking them to give is driven by their worship of Christ, their allegiance to Christ. If Paul's most concerned about the glory of, their, of his Savior, he's wanting to give Jesus all the glory due his name. And he's trying to teach the Corinthians to do the same. That's how Paul's mind is working. So everything he's asking runs through the filter of what brings the most glory to God. And here he's asking again, what's your priority, Corinthians? Is Jesus your main priority? Is the gospel your main priority? Is Christ really the king of your life? Because if he is, it means you're going to sacrifice some things for the sake of everybody else. That's what love does. 
That's what love for God does. It lays down our rights in service to the Lord. That's what love for people does. It sacrifices for the good of others in the church and outside of it because our example is Christ. And so Paul, in his example to this church, has shown them that kind of love. My hope is that's what we're about here at Hilltown. So as we leave today, I have three very quick questions that I want to ask. I want to leave you with them, and I want you to take them home, pray about them, reflect on them, ask the Lord these things. The first is this, does Christ, his gospel, and his kingdom shape my priorities, or does something else? The question is, what drives me? Why do I do what I do? Is it my family? Is it my reputation? Is it my retirement? Or is it Christ and his kingdom? Is it my concern for Christ and for his sake? Or is it something else? The second question is, am I willing to sacrifice my rights for the sake of the gospel? What does that look like? The three easy ones to get out, every pastor's done this before, time, talent, treasure, right? But it's bigger than that. It's a question of, of, you have every right to spend your time in certain ways. Are you carving out times through your week, not just to make the church your social calendar, but to spend yourself out in service to King Jesus? Are you doing it with your finances? I'm not asking you necessarily to give here. I'm not caring what you give. Nobody, none of the elders are going to ask you, please give here and give here and give here and give here until it hurts. The question is, are you giving of your time and your money in service to the gospel going forth? And the third, not time, talent, and treasure, but time, money, and comfort for the modern American church. It's really easy to be comfortable. Hilton, we had better be about sacrificing ourselves and our time and our money for the sake of the gospel. But are you willing to sacrifice your comforts? A lot of you have worked hard for a comfortable living. You have the right to that. You can take that, no question. But are you potentially willing to sacrifice that comfort for some discomfort? Sometimes we need to step outside of not just our comfort zone, but to serve in a place or to serve in an area where I feel like we're not particularly gifted and watch how God moves. For some of you, that's a question of moving into a new ministry. For some of you, that discomfort means having a hard conversation with a friend or a colleague, a family member for the sake of the gospel. For some of you, God is calling you to go, to be in full-time ministry. Could be in missions, could be at a camp, could be in college ministry, could be down the road, it could be across the world, but you've been feeling that tug, that conviction from the Spirit toward that work. Are you willing to sacrifice the current comfort you feel and embark on a journey to follow Christ wherever he would call you? Church family, this is supposed to be a place where we gather to see lives transformed. Right? Certainly God can carry our burden. Certainly God can give us joy as we worship and fellowship together. But everybody here has been called by God for something specific. To preach and proclaim Christ and to bring the gospel to the nations. Are you willing to give up your comfort to serve Christ and for the gospel to go forth? Because it's much easier to sit and think somebody else is going to take care of that, right? Right? So the last question is this, what can I do with my resources, my time, my gifts for the advancement of the gospel in Christ's kingdom? First within my own family, then within my church, and then within the community, right? So let's say you're willing to sacrifice your rights, you're willing to think about parting with some things. What do you do? Are you willing to share the gospel? To step out in faith and trust that God will go before you? Do you want to see God move 
in this church? God is clearly at work at Hilltown Baptist Church. What are we to do at Hilltown? We're to make disciples. That's what Paul's mission was. To make disciples in Corinth, in Ephesus, Berea, Thessalonica, Galatia. He went to make disciples of Christ everywhere he went. That's what we're called to do. And we're to give our lives toward the mission of seeing the gospel transform everything about us. First, right? Transform me, Christ, and then use me to bring that message to other people so that their lives can be transformed to the glory of God. In some way, somehow, right now, would you be willing to commit to that? Whatever it looks like for you, are you willing to commit to something bigger than yourself? Pouring yourself out in the name of the gospel. Not just here on Sundays. In your families. In your workplaces. Potentially across the globe where God calls you. Are you willing to spend and to be spent? Pour it out for the sake of the gospel. So the question we start with is the question we end up with. What would you give up for gospel growth? Let's pray. God, please make us willing vessels, Father, to serve in the field that you have placed us. Father, you have given us opportunity after opportunity to bring your gospel to people who are lost and dying and in need of hope that can only be found in Christ, joy that can only be found in Christ, peace that can only be found in knowing Christ. We ask you, Father, that you would burden our hearts, that you would convict us, and that you would challenge us to be the lights that you have called into our communities, our workplaces, our families, and our neighborhoods, that in all that we do, we might bring honor and glory to you. Your name. Amen.